Okay, good morning and welcome again to the McCook Farm Ranch and Hemp Expo. We have a special guest here this morning, Todd Whitney from the University of Nebraska Extension. He will be talking about regenerative cropping and drought conditions. So we'd like to welcome Todd Whitney. He'll be here with us speaking for the next half hour. Thank you very much, Todd. Hey, thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Brian. Well, I do appreciate the opportunity to come out and visit with you. I don't think that drought is necessarily something that we look forward to. We always think of being a little bit on the, the dry side here in this region. But when it gets to be extreme drought, such as happens about every 10 years, uh, then we do get a little bit more concerned about what the long-term impacts of that are going to be. So as we think about what happened this last year, uh, there will probably be some lessons that we learned from this that we hopefully move forward and learn from. As we think about, well, what are some of the things that we've recommended in the past? Well, some of those things would be uh, that we do want to conserve the moisture that we do receive. We want to think about building the soil residue and the organic matter and think about what are those types of crop rotations that maybe fit into our environment and then set some realistic yield goals uh, to reflect what the conditions are that we're having. So as we think about the easy button, I think uh, whether it be uh, managing weeds, uh, we've been used to being able to use a, a certain type of technology that uh, maybe worked fairly well. Didn't have to think about how all the different types of the systems fit in together, uh, the different pieces. Uh, but as we are looking at crop and livestock managers, maybe we have to do some things differently. And so as we think about if we don't have an easy button, uh, we may have to think differently. And, and how do we look upon uh, our strategies and what's, what are we going to do as we move forward? So what crops are you currently growing? Uh, maybe you might want to think about switching uh, to some crops that maybe fit into your system better. Uh, maybe think about what you're doing now or there's some things that you need to do uh, whether it's adjusting uh, your populations that you have whether it's thinking about picking out uh, those that have the resistance to to drought or whatever those systems might be you might also think about well what are some of those different types of crops that you might be thinking about uh, we do know that things like barley and millet and sorghums are probably going to have a little more drought tolerance than say our traditional corn and soybeans that we see here in Nebraska as you go especially east. So as we think about what those crops are, uh, how does it fit into a rotation? I think at one time we had a little more wheat that was grown. I think maybe that could be a little bit more of an emphasis that we look at. But also our traditional cane and, and our peas. Uh, field peas are very helpful when it comes to maybe thinking about adding some diversity into your system. Well, our history's been uh, that drought does happen about every 10 years. Uh, you go back in time and think about uh, 2012, 2013. Uh, those are some times where we did have some dry, extreme conditions. Uh, some people can remember uh, back when uh, we had a profile uh, that came into that, that time frame, and it ended up that for some cases, uh, the 2013 was actually kind of a harder uh, condition to go through in 2012. We have a similar thing happening now as we look at what could happen. Uh, will drought happen, severe drought into 2023? Uh, I don't know if anyone knows exactly what's gonna happen as we move forward, but we do have a concern that we don't have as much profile now as we did coming into this growing season. So when we're lacking profile moisture, uh, it is one of those concerns that we have about uh, how can we look at this. And if we look at our conservation practices, uh, we have in the past thought about, well, what are those things that we need to always think about? And so here's an example of what we call the ET values, the evaporation and the transpiration. And these conditions always exist. As we think about having soil, uh, when we have open soil, soil that's not covered, there's more chance that we're going to have evaporation that's going to cause us some problems. When we have a covered soil, or we have good canopy, uh, that transpiration is probably going to be the highest use of the water uh, versus the evaporation that's going to be about 20 to 30 percent. 
of the water that's being used on that acre. So for the entire growing season, we are thinking about the combination of evaporation and transpiration, and we call that ET, when we try to calculate, especially for irrigators, when they're trying to decide, well, how much should be applied. So when the crop is fully shaded, then we can get that transpiration value, uh, especially the evaporation part, to go very, very low. Uh, so generally, uh, during the, the full canopy period of production, we're going to have about 90 to 98 percent of the water being used exactly by the plant, and it's going to be transpiring as it's doing its photosynthesis process, trying to convert the sunlight energy into something that can be marketed or being used as a forage later on. So when the crop is small, almost all of our loss of moisture, our ET, is going to be in the, in the form of evaporation versus the transpiration, which is used, the water usage by the crop. We can reduce this evaporation with practices that leave more residue on the soil surface. So we have been emphasizing the use of minimum tillage, no-till uh, practices that are allowing us to be able to try to save as much of that residue and leave it on the soil surface so we can provide some protection and reduce this evaporation. So as we think about um, focusing then on transpiration and trying to have less evaporation, then we have been, in a sense, moving toward, well, it's healthy to have uh, lots of residue on the soil surface. So we have this pr principle of less evaporation, uh, less uh, solar energy loss, trying to uh, increase our capacity to reduce the wind erosion. Also, when we have the residue, we think about we have less crusting, more infiltration, less runoff, all those positives that happen from that. And then we think about, well, if we can even leave, leave some of the stalks out in the field that are going to catch snow uh, when we have snow events, then traditionally uh, this is one of those things that we get pretty familiar with and say, well, this is a positive so that we can have a profile for the next year. As we think about some of our research uh, at North Platte, uh, the experiment station is saying that, well, compared to bare soil, if you have residue covering the soil, uh, you may have as much as a 25 bushel per acre increase by being able to have cover on the soil that's going to help. So in that uh, 25 bushel increase, interpretation of that is that we're having about two and a half to three and a half inches more of available moisture because we've been able to save that. And so if we look at the, the critical inch of water usage, usually for corn, that's going to be about 10 to 12 bushels to the acre advantage for every inch that we're able to be able to preserve and then use as we move in. As we think about the residue and the cover, uh, again, this is another study that was done that second year following the drought year, and you can see that there was still about a, a 23 bushel difference where there had been some residue to help hold the moisture, help on that residue cover. So again, we usually say that the, there's about uh, an inch and a half more moisture, maybe as much as two and a half, when we're able to have a, an armor or protection versus just having a bare soil. And as it translates into some of the things that are there, uh, we have to think in terms of, well, what's a holistic approach to how do we increase our surface moisture? But we've had the negative happen this year. Uh, in some cases, we were so dry that we had very, very dry residue that ended up being a fuel for some of the wildfires that happened. So we've had people asking, well, should we still be focusing on having that residue out there if it's going to be a fuel for the fire that's going to move across? Hmm. And I think we have to think in terms of let's, let's ask the right questions. Um, are we questioning whether we should have residue? And I think that our answer should be no. We do know that the research is sharing that by having residue out there, it helps protect the soil. But we might be asking the question, should we also be trying to do something that's going to give us some benefit? How do we get, get some greenness out there that's going to give us a chance to be able to slow down some of these fires, uh, maybe have going back to some of the strip farming that we had, had done back in, in previous years, 
maybe we need to look at that a little bit more on how we can incorporate that in. Also think about, are we trying to build organic matter? The organic matter is what helps us hold a lot of the moisture that happens. A lot of our rain events are turning into uh, really uh, uh, toad strangler rainfall events that happen sometime in the spring. And so when we have those intense rains, sometimes if we don't have enough organic matter or residue to help hold that water, uh, it can sometimes run off of a field and our effective rainfall amounts will drop down. So to help do that, uh, to build the soils, probably two of the crops that you might think about putting into some of the mixes, whether it be cover crop or what you're using, could be oats or flax, uh, are very helpful on building the mycorrhizae uh, and trying to build in the beneficial fungi. Also think about matching your cropping systems. Are we going to still have a drought as we move into the next year? Uh, I think most of the predictions are that yes, we're probably going to have to still deal with some, some degree of drought or severeness as we move into this next cycle. There's been some hope we'll get some, some snow events, uh, hopefully helpful. Uh, and not cause us uh, to make the problem as far as the livestock go, but toward the end of the winter, we may pick up a little bit of, of, of snow. You get up to Bismarck, uh, North Dakota, they already have two to three feet of snow up in that region. So there's regions of the nation that are getting the moisture. We just seem to be kind of skirting around some of those moisture fronts like happened this summer. Uh, since it's been a no pattern, then we still have kind of where it rains and rains, where it snows and snows, and then where it misses, it continues to miss. So, so as we're thinking about that, maybe we do have to think in terms of, let's adjust our planting populations, let's think about our fertilizer, our crop inputs, and let's maybe not plan for those high production years that we start thinking in terms of how can we, we adjust our goals and think about Murphy's Law. What happens if the drought does continue? What happens if everything goes wrong and you're trying to think, well, what am I gonna do? Some regions have good rains this year. Not far away, maybe go 10 or 12 miles and you might go from just having a really small amount of rain, um, maybe six inches uh, to where maybe the season, some, some other location not far away had 16 or 17. Um, and so, as we think about it, what we're trying to do is to keep that residue there, help reduce the wind erosion events that might happen, and start thinking about being an observer and being flexible with your rotations. Is your farm or ranch weather ready? How do we keep a green uh, fire strip? Well, maybe the, the challenge is thinking about how can we keep something growing as much as possible on that land throughout the growing season. So maybe a chance for you to think about, uh, well, maybe we could put in something that's gonna be green over the winter. Maybe you planted some wheat or triticale or some rye that's gonna be able to, to be there in case we do have some conditions again where we have the dryness continue, we have some wildfires. Uh, there have been some cases even the last couple of weeks uh, uh, there was a fire around Wilcox where uh, there was a strip of rye that helped slow the fire down enough that they were able to get it under control. And I think the same type of thing happens uh, as we get into the springtime. That was when we had a lot of our wildfires last year uh, that we think about, well, can we have some of those green? We generally been suggesting that people get away from tillage uh, to help on the residue side, but maybe there's some advantage to having some of those big tillers. Uh, we think about the, the Rapaho area that was helpful where someone did have a large disc that was able to come in and help um, make a fire, fire ban and that helped save the community there. And so there are some cases where have your equipment hooked up to, if you do have, have a case where you have have a fire that gets gets out of control, uh, then it may be helpful to already be hooked up, be ready, be have your um, system in place, uh, whether it be that you have some fertilizer that you're going to be able to spray to help control that. Focus on the, the growing drought tolerant plants, uh, focus on keeping cover protection uh, for forage and livestock. Again, a good mix 
uh, to plant would be barley and oats, sorghum and, and field peas, and just keep a diversity in that mix. And this actually makes a really good feed for livestock. Consider your transitioning. Uh, in some cases, people have use of sunflowers in their mix. Sunflowers can have a deep taproot that can help on getting some diversity into the field, also build some of the soil health. We recommend probably not going sunflowers more than once out of every three years because they do lack some of the uh, top growth uh, for having the residue there, but they do build a lot of uh, soil activity and benefits to that. We usually say you'll follow that with corn. And then we get back to adopt those regenerative ag methods. What do we mean by regenerative? Regenerative are ways that we're going to be helping the system where we're going to be trying to be building rather than just maintaining or sustaining. In regenerative, we're trying to say we're going to regenerate or re rebuild some of that uh, organic matter that we've been losing over time. How do we help build that back in? Well, to help do that, we've got to think in terms of how do we get that carbon back into the system. And the carbon is there to help feed the microbe. It's also there to help on building organic matter so we can save what moisture we do receive. So with that, I'm open to some questions. If you have any questions, I'd be open to working with that. Looks like you answered them all. Okay, I think, I think we'll move on then. Um, for later, if you need to reach me, uh, you have a cell number of 308-995-7272 or contact the Red Willow or your local extension office. Uh, I'm based out of Holdridge, but uh, if you have some questions, I'd be willing to help and, and come out. Thank you and have a great day. Thank you, sir.